Star Trek is full of amazing characters who have been at the center of incredible stories and beloved by fans for decades. Captain Kirk, Spock, Captain Picard, Data, Captain Sisko, Kira, Dax, and the rest, <laughs> including Captain Janeway, of course. <laughs> But Star Trek has also had more than its fair share of characters who, well, let's just say they deserved better. These are characters who often aren't very popular with the fans, who have acquired unflattering reputations that they don't deserve, in my opinion, anyway. And I'm the one making the video, so my opinion's the one that counts. I'm talking about your Wesley Crushers, your Dr. Pulaski's, your Captain Jellicoe's, each of whom has gotten their own video in this series. And I'm talking about the subject of this video. This video right here, that you're watching at this very moment. This video which I am calling Why Keiko O'Brien is Actually Not So Bad. We meet Keiko, who initially goes by her maiden name, Keiko Ishikawa, in the fourth season of Star Trek The Next Generation, in the episode Data's Day, in which Data is preparing to play the role of Father of the Bride in Keiko's wedding to Chief O'Brien. It's a great Data episode, and a great episode overall, but it's not such a great episode for Keiko. In her very first appearance, Keiko's story is that she gets cold feet and cancels the wedding without even talking to O'Brien about it first. She sends Data to deliver the bad news, and then has an emotional outburst when Data drops by later to speak with her on O'Brien's behalf, and then finally decides to go ahead with the wedding anyway because, I don't know, reasons. She changed her mind about the wedding, then she changed it back. Women, am I right? <laughs> That's actually something of a pattern with Keiko's characterization. She's the moody, irrational, demanding wife. I don't blame her for that. She's a female character on a show, two shows actually, predominantly written by men under a creative regime that was... Not exactly known for its sensitive, enlightened, and sophisticated portrayals of women. Thankfully, she's not always written that way, but frequently her role, especially once she relocates to Deep Space Nine, is reduced to that of Chief O'Brien's ball and chain. She's the one who Miles feels obligated to go home to when he'd rather be drinking and playing darts or getting killed in a hollow suite with Bashir. She's the personification of responsibility. She's the destroyer of fun. She's the one who isn't happy on the station. But really, can you blame her? One of the most commonly heard complaints I see from people who don't like Keiko, and <laughs> some of them really, really don't like her, is that she always seems so miserable. Which is an oversimplification. We have plenty of examples from TNG and Deep Space Nine where she isn't miserable, but even if she is miserable all of the time, or even most of the time, you, you get why that might be, right? She falls in love and marries Miles O'Brien while they're both living on the Enterprise D, which, weakly brushes with death aside, seems like one of the cushiest gigs in the galaxy. It's a nice ship filled with nice people. But then Miles gets transferred, a transfer he wanted, we're given to believe, and Keiko has to move from the Enterprise to a space station that is wrecked, remote, from her perspective anyway, and located in the middle of a long-standing, violent, and deeply depressing conflict between the Cardassians and the Bajorans. Instead of living and raising her child and pursuing a career she seems to enjoy aboard the Enterprise, she has to figure out how to do all of those things here. Well, not all of those things, because she has to give up her career as a botanist when they move to Deep Space Nine. So, yeah, I understand why she doesn't always seem thrilled to be there. That is, when the creators of the show bother to include her at all. There are long stretches of Deep Space Nine where Keiko and her and Miles' kids, Molly and later Kiriyoshi, are written out of the show entirely. Keiko goes to Earth to visit her parents. 
Keiko embarks on a months-long botany expedition to Bajor. Keiko and the kids have to leave the station because there's a war on and it's not safe. She's not a character, she's a plot hole to be closed. Or at least that's how it feels a lot of the time. It's a shame because, as I said, she's not always written this way. And when the writers bother to treat her like a character, she's a pretty good one. For example, it wasn't long after the wedding that Keiko found herself implanted with the demonic seed of Clan O'Brien. In the episode Disaster from TNG's fifth season, Keiko goes into labor. You wouldn't think giving birth would be that big of a deal in the 24th century as we see it depicted in Star Trek. The medical facilities on this spaceship seem far better equipped to handle just about anything than the best hospitals in the world today. But Keiko's delivery is complicated somewhat by the fact that the Enterprise is kind of, what's the technical term, all fucked up at the time. The ship collides with a quantum filament, which is a thing the writers made up so the ship could collide with it, and as a result, all the ship's systems are offline. The computer's not working, even the turbo lifts are out of service, which means that until things are fixed, everyone is more or less stuck wherever they were at when the collision occurred. That means Chief O'Brien is stuck on the bridge. He was taking part in a transporter simulation, which is a thing the writers made up to explain why O'Brien is on the bridge, while Keiko is stuck in 10 Forward, where she and Miles were hanging out with Riker and Data before Miles left to see to the aforementioned transporter simulation. At first, things seem okay, relatively speaking. Riker and Data leave to see if they can get to main engineering and reestablish control of the ship. They leave Worf in charge in 10 Forward. Keiko helps out treating injured people. But then, uh-oh, Keiko goes into labor. Who could have seen that coming? Of all the things to happen while the ship is in the midst of an emergency, good Lord of mercy, I just never would have expected this in a million years. Gracious. Anyway, that's kind of how Worf feels about it, too. Keiko says, hey, I'm going into labor. And Worf's like, now? Really? Have you thought about not going into labor? Because everybody's super busy here, and this is just going to be one more thing, and you know how. Here comes the head! So for the rest of the episode, while Captain Picard is dragging a bunch of kids up an elevator shaft and Geordi and Dr. Crusher are suffocating themselves to put out a fire in a cargo bay and Counselor Troy, the senior officer on the bridge, is debating whether to follow Ensign Rowe's advice to abandon everyone in the lower half of the ship to die or O'Brien's advice to not do that. And Data is begging Riker to decapitate him so they can make it to engineering. It really is the wackiest life or death space disaster ever. I love this episode. We also occasionally check in on the happenings in 10 Forward, where Keiko and Worf are working a pretty solid set as a comedy double act. Worf scans Keiko with his tricorder and says, Oh, you are dilating like a boss. Everything seems to be proceeding smoothly. This birth couldn't be going better. And Keiko's like, has the baby turned yet? Turned into what? 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 Worf admits that he's never actually delivered a baby before. He took an emergency medical course where he delivered a baby in a holodeck simulation, but that's it. When his tricorder tells him that Keiko is sufficiently dilated, he tells her, you may now give birth, in the detached but pleasant tone of an automated tour guide announcing that the site of Pickett's Charge is just ahead on the right. They go into the standard she's having a baby shtick that we've seen in countless sitcoms over the years. Worf tells Keiko to push. Keiko yells at Worf and screams from the pain and the effort. It seems like giving birth really sucks. Why does anyone do it? But the standard shtick is embellished by a clever little bit where Worf is not only talking Keiko through it, but talking himself through it, too. He says things like, I must urge you gently but firmly to push harder before doing just that, as though reassuring himself that this is the correct thing to do. It's funny and endearing, and when it's all over, hey, it's a baby! which is like a cat or a dog, only way less fun and a much longer-term commitment. So, you might have noticed 
that while Keiko is the one giving birth, those scenes aren't really about her. And it's actually Worf who has the more interesting part to play. In this case, I don't have a problem with that so much, even when I specifically approach it from the perspective of evaluating Keiko's role. Like I said, Worf and Keiko function as a double act here, and Keiko is the straight man. She's essential. The act doesn't work without her. And this particular pairing is funnier because Keiko being the straight man isn't necessarily the way you might expect it to go. Worf's usual demeanor makes him the ideal straight man, so it's a surprise and a pleasure to see him forced into the opposite role. And it wouldn't work at all without Keiko providing the anchor as the straight man. Whether it's as half of a comedy duo or in some other arrangement, this is the sort of thing supporting characters are for. Sure, Keiko isn't at the center of the story in Disaster, nor is she really at the center of her scenes, but that doesn't mean she's being poorly used. She's a supporting character doing what supporting characters do, and doing so in a way that doesn't lean on lazy tropes or demeaning stereotypes, or at least doesn't lean on them too heavily. I mentioned that she and Worf do the standard sitcom giving birth shtick, but they put their own spin on it. Not only does Worf have his talking himself through it step-by-step -step bit, Keiko also gets to play a bit of non-standard business, since she has to be not only the person giving birth, but also the one helping Worf to help her. Plus, while she does scream at Worf a little, she doesn't go nearly as over the top as pregnant sitcom characters typically do during this scene. Contrast Keiko's role in Disaster with how she's used in Power Play a bit later in TNG's fifth season. Once again, she finds herself trapped in 10 Forward, only this time she really doesn't have anything to do other than be a hostage. Baby Molly won't stop crying, and Chief O'Brien, who has been possessed by an alien entity, says to Keiko, Hey, I think the guy I'm possessing really loves you, but shut that kid up. And that's pretty much it. Overall, Power Play is a pretty good episode, but as far as its treatment of Keiko, uh, it could be better. She's still doing what supporting characters do, but her role is much more passive, and she, as an individual, comes across as more nondescript. It matters more what she is than who she is, which isn't necessarily a problem. On a long-running series with lots of recurring characters popping in and out, you would expect that sort of thing from time to time. It's just a lot more noticeable with characters like Keiko, who aren't seen super often to begin with, and have the potential to be featured in much more interesting ways. For an example of that, let's skip ahead to Deep Space Nine, where finding interesting ways to feature recurring characters was kind of a house specialty. Keiko didn't benefit as much from this as, say, Garrick or Nog or Damar, but she did get a few moments to shine over the course of the series. Though my personal favorite Keiko episode of DS9 comes from the show's criminally underrated first season. And how can people say, oh, you know, Star Trek shows take three seasons to really warm up and get good, when Deep Space Nine's excellent first season is right there? I'm going to do an entire video about this eventually, but real quick, check out the highlights of DS9 Season 1, Emissary arguably the best pilot episode of any Star Trek show, Progress, a great episode about the individual human costs that can be incurred while acting for the greater good, and an important early episode in Kira's character arc, Vortex, another favorite of mine where a criminal arrested aboard the station claims to know secrets about Odo's mysterious species, leading to a story where we see that Odo has depths beyond gruff authoritarian, and Duet, another classic Kira-centered episode, and one of the best shows DS9 or any Star Trek show ever produced. Hell, even some of the bad episodes in season one are at least fun. I could watch Move Along Home or Dramatis Personae right now and have a goddamn ball. And actually, you know what? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Across the 
the stars long after your petty treacheries have been forgotten. A goddamn ball, says I. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, my favorite Keiko episode, which just so happens to be another highlight of DS9 Season 1 and an episode I've talked about before, way back when I did my video about how Deep Space Nine models religious tolerance. I'm speaking of the show's first season finale, a little episode titled In the Hands of the Prophets. So, like I mentioned earlier, Keiko's job aboard the Enterprise is that of a botanist. She works in the ship's arboretum, but when she moves to Deep Space Nine with Miles, she leaves that job behind. Eventually, seeing what a bunch of juvenile delinquents they've got running up and down the corridors and catwalks, Keiko starts a school and becomes the station's resident teacher. At the beginning of In the Hands of the Prophets, Keiko is teaching her class about the wormhole. Then, a woman, a Bajoran cleric, enters the classroom and stands in the back. Oh, God damn it! who is this? A parent? Come to observe? My taxes pay your salary and I want to see what you're teaching my kid. It had better not be anything about the ongoing effects of institutional racism on our society or how LGBTQ people exist. I'm actually only half-joking, which you know if you've seen this episode, which, I mean, you probably have, right? Anyway, this is, of course, Vedic Wynn. And she's got a few notes for Keiko about how she teaches the kids about the wormhole, because while Keiko has been describing it scientifically, Wynn views it in more religious terms, and she wants the students to hear about that. Stop calling them wormhole entities. They are the prophets. And why haven't you told these children about the celestial temple? You're teaching blasphemy. And I'm going to blow up this school! What? Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So Keiko goes to Commander Sisko's office and says, Can you please get this Karen Wynn off my back? And Kira's there like, That's not her name. Right, sorry, I forgot. Wynn Karen. Can you get her off my back? Sisko's like, maybe we can find some common ground. Kira, what do you think about Wynn? Oh, she's nuts. A hardcore fundamentalist. A real fanatic. Jesus, who would support someone like that? Me. I'm totally on her side. But you just said she's a fanatic. Yeah, and I've literally been a terrorist. Besides, I don't think it would hurt for you to sprinkle some Bajaran spirituality into your school curriculum. You do have a lot of Bajaran students. Bajaran religious leaders don't get to dictate what I teach in my classroom. Then maybe we need to get the Bajaran kids a proper Bajaran teacher. Are you saying I'm not fit to teach your children? Maybe. Do you want to go? Is that what you're saying to me right now? Because if you want to go, we can go, baby. Okay, I'm just going to step in here because... Keiko, she would kill you. I just want both of you to know that I think there's room on this station for all philosophies. Your godless naturalism, Keiko, and your hokey ancient superstitions, Kira. I trust we can all find a way to coexist in peace. Later, Keiko and Miles walk up on Wynn giving a little speech on the promenade. Wynn sees them and approaches Keiko like, Hey, listen, I'm a reasonable person, and I think we can find a way to coexist in peace. So here's my proposal. Just don't teach your students anything about the wormhole at all. Keiko's like, What about when it comes time to teach about the creation of the universe or the evolution of life? You're a religious conservative. You probably believe the first Bajaran hatched from an egg laid by a hen that had mated with a rooster possessed by one of the prophets. Well, I'm happy to see you've been studying our holy books, but we don't need to worry about that right now. We can cross that bridge when we come to it. And Keiko's like, no deal, Win. I'm an educator, and my job is to expose my students to knowledge, not hide it from them. Well, I tried to extend an olive branch, or whatever the Bajaran version of that is, but if you're going to be so unreasonable as to insist on exposing children to knowledge, I'm afraid we have nothing else to talk about. And then she blows up the school. Well, not personally. 
more accurate to say she has the school blown up. Unfortunately, that's the last we see of Keiko in the episode, as the focus shifts from the school to how the school's bombing fits into Wynne's plan to assassinate Burial, her rival in the upcoming election, to choose a new leader of the Bajoran religion. This is an excellent episode. A solid way to close out the show's first season, but I do wish the writers had found a way to return to Keiko, even if only briefly, before the end. Because in the scenes in which she does appear in this episode, Keiko is a boss. She's the one lighting the candle to hold back the darkness of religious fundamentalism. She's the educator who stands her ground and refuses to bow to the unreasonable and, it turns out, disingenuous demands of extremists. She's the voice of science, which makes sense given what little we know about her beyond the fact that she's Mrs. O'Brien on the Enterprise. She was a scientist, a botanist, so it plays as natural that she feels strongly about school science lessons consisting of, you know, science rather than religious mythology. The Keiko we see in this episode is someone with courage, integrity, and a sense of responsibility for her community. The whole reason she starts a school in the first place is because she's concerned about the welfare of the kids living on the station. She's a good person, a person who cares about other people and about the state of the world. And she's stubborn. If she's convinced she's right, she doesn't back down easily. And she's smart, which we see a glimpse of in another DS9 episode, called Armageddon Game. In this episode, Chief O'Brien and Dr. Bashir are reported dead following an accident during a mission to help some aliens dispose of a deadly biological weapon. But the accident was staged, and O'Brien and Bashir are on the run for their lives, having to contend with the aliens who still want them dead, and the effects of the bioweapon which has infected O'Brien. Back on the station, the rest of the crew has sadly accepted the news that O'Brien and Bashir are dead. The rest of the crew, that is, except for Keiko, who, after watching the security camera video of the accident, marches into Cisco's office and declares that the video has been tampered with. Her evidence? In the moments before the accident, Chief O'Brien is seen taking a sip of coffee. But according to the timestamp, this occurred in the late afternoon, and Keiko is insistent that Miles never drinks coffee at that time of day. It keeps him up at night. Plus, if you rewind that security video far enough, you'll see that this was actually Chief O'Brien's second cup of coffee. But Miles never has a second cup of my coffee. Keiko even draws Cisco's attention to a spectroscopic analysis of the liquid in O'Brien's cup in the video, which proves that it is coffee, not tea or hot chocolate or a nice cup of instant soup, which I know isn't good for you, what with being high in sodium, but is oh so convenient. The episode ends on a note of ironic comedy that undercuts Keiko's coffee-based insight. With Chief O'Brien and Dr. Bashir safely back aboard the station, Keiko and Miles are chatting in the infirmary, and Miles says, You know what I could go for right now? A cup of coffee. And Keiko's like, Coffee? In the afternoon? Are you a replicant again? Where's my husband? I always drink coffee in the afternoon. A what? You think you know somebody. How shattering. Speaking of which... I wish we had a chance to get to know Keiko a little better. I wish she and Rosalind Chow, the wonderful actor who played her, had been given more opportunities to show us who she is. She wasn't always treated well by the writers of the shows she was on. I think a lot of the negative sentiments held toward her by fans are rooted in the times when she's portrayed as the nagging wife. Chief O'Brien's ball and chain, the thing standing between miles and a good time. And honestly, I wish those portrayals just didn't exist. I find them sexist, shallow, and lazy. But I also wish we got to see more of the Keiko who fights for secular education against religious extremism, or who stubbornly refuses to accept that her spouse is dead and pushes for an investigation that leads to that spouse's safe return or who, along with Miles, makes a difficult and personally painful decision that is in the best interests of her temporarily displaced daughter in the episode Time's Orphan, which I didn't get into here. But if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's a good show. 
unlike certain other recurring characters from TNG and inexplicably DS9, we see that there's more to Keiko than her most off-putting qualities. We also see that she has wit and courage and determination. There was potential for her to be so much more than what she was. Because she's only featured very occasionally, a mere 27 total appearances, 8 on TNG and 19 on DS9, and because she's written somewhat poorly in a not insignificant portion of those, I can't honestly say that I think Keiko is a great character, but I can say that there was potential for greatness there. Potential that went unrealized. And that's a shame, because Keiko... Keiko's actually not so bad. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Wes Adams, thank you Wes. Liam De La Vega, thank you Liam. Russell Crockett, thank you Russell. Mark Teal, thank you Mark. Saul Merck, thank you Saul Merck. Christopher, thank you, Christopher. With great power, Ken Rogers, thank you, Ken. Jonathan Dell, thank you, Jonathan. Shatterhand2049, thank you, Shatterhand2049. Brian Hilke, thank you, Brian. Next, new channel members. James Gassick, who rejoined last month, thank you, James. Foreign Keys, thank you, Foreign Keys. Sean Collins, who also rejoined last month. Thank you, Sean. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up, or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out, at the end of a Trek Actually video, I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. Of course, if you want to support this channel with a one-time gift rather than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that through PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. And once again, if you want to help out on a regular basis, please go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek-themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low-ranking Starfleet officers. We have just begun our fifth season. So if you've never listened before, this is a great time to jump aboard. You can listen to all our past episodes and our new episodes as they're released at the links in the video description. Give a listen to the Ensign's Log, I think you'll really dig it. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and another series, or sometimes a movie, that I have never seen before. We've just begun season three of DS9. On the off weeks from DS9, we're watching the Netflix original animated series, Hilda. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, as chosen by my patrons and members, is one I have wanted to do 
for a long time. It's been an option in the poll several times and has never won, but now, at long last, its time has come. This topic gives me an opportunity to zoom out and take a look at Star Trek from outside of Star Trek, analyzing characters and episodes and themes and messages and all the other fascinating things we find in the content of Star Trek is a lot of fun and I'm going to keep right on doing that, but there are other topics related to Star Trek that I find just as fascinating but that deal with matters that exist mostly outside the story world. For example, what were the inspirations for Star Trek? What were the shows or films or books that were similar to Star Trek, but before Star Trek? We'll examine some of those next month as we explore the question, where did Star Trek actually come from? See you then. Thanks for watching and take care, everybody.